We're now going to read the Bible, and this morning we're reading from Mark chapter 9, starting at verse 14 and up until verse 29. Mark 9 from verse 14. When they came to the other disciples, they saw a large crowd around them and the teachers of the law arguing with them. As soon as all the people saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed with wonder and ran to greet him. What are you arguing with them about? he asked. A man in the crowd answered, Teacher, I brought you my son, who is possessed by a spirit that has robbed him of speech. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him to the ground. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth and becomes rigid. I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they could not. Oh, unbelieving generation, Jesus replied, how long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. So they brought him. When the spirit saw Jesus, it immediately threw the boy into a convulsion. He fell to the ground and rolled around, foaming at the mouth. Jesus asked the boy's father, How long has he been like this? From childhood, he answered. It has often thrown him into the fire or water to kill him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. If you can, said Jesus, everything is possible for him who believes. Immediately, the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. When Jesus saw that a crowd was running to the scene, he rebuked the evil spirit. You deaf and mute spirit, he said, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. The spirit shrieked, convulsed him violently and came out. The boy looked so much like a corpse that many said, he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him to his feet and he stood up. After Jesus had gone indoors, his disciples asked him privately, why couldn't we drive it out? He replied, this kind can come out only by prayer. Thank you. <coughs> Excuse me. Thank you, Melinda. Uh, keep your Bibles open. Uh, there's obviously some strange and unusual details in this story. There's some confusing and challenging things. We're going to try and pick it apart because it's some really important things as well uh, and important things for us to hear. So keep your Bible with you. We're going to work our way through these verses together this morning. Uh, Back when I was in high school, uh, in early high school, I decided uh, I'd have a crack at trying club basketball. You know, we'd played school basketball for for a while, but we thought we'd give it a try, stepping up to the next level and try, try club uh, I liked basketball, so playing more was, was good. Uh, and it was kind of an opportunity to see, you know, if I could make something of this and, you know, advance. Uh, how far could I get in this sport? The answer, it turns out, is not very far. Um, but besides that, we, we had a good time. Uh, we had a really great team. We had a team of really great players. Uh, and because we were new, we got to start that season in C grade. You know, it didn't want to throw us in the deep end, so we got to start in C grade, which was awesome. <laughs> It was awesome because we got to dominate. (laughs) We were getting huge scores every week, you know, 80 to 100 points. Everyone was getting great stats. It was the best. We thought we were pretty hot stuff. But then the league got reshuffled uh, and we got bumped to B grade, which was not awesome because it turns out B grade was really hard. turns out maybe we weren't quite as good as we thought we were uh, and we had to really work for it. We had to really try, and sometimes we even lost, which was devastating. (laughs) Now that said, where do you think we learn to be better players? (laughs) The answer's obvious, isn't it? (laughs) Yeah, not in secret. (laughs) We learn when we're we're, we're pushed, don't we? We learn uh, in the challenges, because that's true of us, isn't it? It's true of life kind of in general, isn't it? We learn kind of less on the highs than we we do in the lows. We learn more in the challenges sometimes than we do in the successes. And we're going to see that in our story today. Last week, uh, if you're here or if you've glanced back at what we looked at, Mark gave us a great high. 
you know, both literally and, and spiritually. Jesus and his disciples up on top of the mountain in this incredible experience, seeing Jesus transformed and, and getting that taste of his glory. It's, it's a wonderful picture. But now we come down the mountain into a real low point, both literally and spiritually. We come off the mountain and we come into chaos. Now, let's be clear, not so much for Jesus, but definitely for his followers. Things have gone from very good to very hard and very strange. But there's a lot for us to be learning here. See, it's one thing to see Jesus in all his glory and to, to see that taste of what he can bring. It's another thing to learn to believe and trust and follow him. I mean, what, what does that even mean? We use those words all the time, don't we? Just believe in Jesus. But what does that mean? What does that look like? It's so hard to define. How does it work? Well, that's what we're going to learn this morning as we open up this passage together. Now, as we've seen, Jesus comes off this mountaintop experience and he descends into this really chaotic scene. Let me just remind you of it. Verse 14. When they came to the other disciples, they saw a large crowd around them and the teachers of the law arguing with them. As soon as all the people saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed with wonder and ran to greet him. What are you arguing with them about, he asked. A man in the crowd answered, Teacher, I brought you my son who is possessed by a spirit that has robbed him of speech. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him to the ground. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth and becomes rigid. I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they could not. So Jesus comes down from this mountaintop. It's not like he's been away for ages and ages, but, but the crowds swarm to him. You know, things, are, things have been quite chaotic here. They, they run to him. There's this crisis and they need his help. We're, we're told there's arguments. We're not told what the argument's about. But at the center of this scene is this father and his young boy whom he's brought to Jesus. This father is, is desperate. He's been seeking help. And yet Jesus' disciples haven't been able to do anything for him. They haven't been able to do the job that Jesus had set them. I mean, how frustrating for him to come from this great mountaintop experience and to come down and find out that your followers once again have let you down. And we, we see that, don't we? We see Jesus' exasperation. Look at verse 19. Oh, unbelieving generation, Jesus replied, how long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. You might remember, uh, it's months ago now, but we, uh, we saw previously that Jesus had sent out the disciples on a mission. Uh, it's a few chapters ago. He'd sent them out into the area to preach his name and to do all sorts of things in his name. And, and they did. They, they healed the sick. They cast out demons previously. But now, all of a sudden, in this encounter, it doesn't seem like they're able to. Something seems to be tripping them up and they're, they're prevented from that. Why is that happening? Well, Jesus diagnosed it, didn't he? He diagnosed it. He said, Oh, unbelieving generation. He puts his finger on the problem here, and the problem is unbelief. There's an issue of unbelief here. And yet, despite his exasperation, despite his frustration with the disciples and with the crowd, Jesus still shows compassion. Uh, look at verse 20. So they brought him, that is the boy. Uh, when the spirit saw Jesus, it immediately threw the boy into a convulsion. He fell to the ground and rolled around, foaming at the mouth. Jesus asked the boy's father, How long has he been like this? From childhood, he answered. It has often thrown him into fire or water to kill him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. <laughs> See, despite Jesus' frustration, he still sees the desperate need here. You know, picture this poor father with this, this boy suffering in this way. Jesus wants to hear. He wants to know. But the crux is in what the Father says to him. Did you? I don't know if you saw it there as we read it. The Father says, If you can, 
Now he's brought it to the brought his son to the disciples, and the disciples couldn't do anything. And so he turns to Jesus now, if you can. Can you, Jesus? This is what Jesus says, verse 23. If you can, said Jesus, everything is possible for him who believes. Immediately the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. You know, you, you almost hear Jesus' it, frustration growing. If you can, what, what are you talking about? Have you seen what I've done? Of course I can. Everything, in fact, is possible for him who believes. And that's it right there, isn't it? That's, that's the center of this story. Everything is possible for him who believes. Everything is possible for him who believes. We need to delve into that because that is a, a wonderful thing and a dangerous thing. There's a trap here, isn't there? There's a trap for us. Uh, we can easily hear everything is possible and think, wow, that, that's, that's awesome, you know, belief or, or lack thereof. Uh, that can create or prevent anything that we want. You know, if I just believe, then, then anything is possible. How amazing is this that Jesus is saying? You know, we, we read in one of the other Gospels, Jesus says to his disciples, uh, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you can tell this tree to uproot itself and throw itself in the ocean. And, you know, we, we think we'd never ask for that. that that's quite strange. But, but we think, well, if that's what faith the size of a mustard seed can do, you know, imagine, imagine if I had faith the size of a mango seed, a mango pip. You know, imagine what we could do then. But that's missing the point of what Jesus is saying. See, Jesus is telling us this. Jesus is, is not making a point that, that you know, faith could do whatever it wants if there's just a sufficient quantity of faith. Now, it's not the point that you know, more faith gets better or more things. That's not what Jesus is saying at all. The point is, everything is possible for him who believes. Not by the size of that belief, not by the strength of that belief, but by the strength of the one believed in. He who believes in Jesus can receive anything from Jesus. It's not the power of the faith that matters. It's the object of the faith that counts. It's not the power of the faith that matters. It's the object of faith that counts. Uh, maybe you can think of it like this. Two people come into our church service this morning. They say hi at the door. They comment on Steve's terrible tie. Uh, they sanitize their hands, they sign in and because they're doing the right thing they move through and they come to the main church building and decide they need to find a chair. Now both of them see these plastic chairs, they're not terribly impressed but they understand COVID so we don't do things quite like we might normally do. One of them sees the chairs and thinks, they look kind of fragile. You know, I'm not the, I'm not the biggest guy but I just don't know if that chair is going to hold me. I'm worried that if I sit on that chair, it's going to break. Now, the other one looks at a chair and says, yeah, those chairs are fine. Look, they've been used for ages. Not a problem. They're going to be all right. But, of course, there's people lining up behind them by now as they dilly-dally around in the doorway, and so they have to find their place, and they do. Uh, one very fearful, one very confident. They go and find their chair. One very cautiously lowers himself down. The other very confidently lowers himself down. And here's the question, who falls on the ground? <laughs> the answer is no one, isn't it? <laughs> Neither of them fall on the ground, unless they miss the chair, but that's a different story altogether. Neither of them fall on the ground. Whose chair holds them? Well, of, of course, it's both, isn't it? It's not your confidence in the chair that makes it able to hold you up. The strength of the chair is perfectly adequate, by the way. Whether your belief in that chair is strong or whether it's weak, the chair is still capable of holding you. It's that the chair is still strong. And that's Jesus' point here. <laughs> it's the object of that belief. It's the object of that faith that counts. Belief, not its size, not its strength, but simply belief. Now, the, the Father's words here are great, aren't they? I, I do believe. Help my unbelief. And Jesus does. Verse 25. 
When Jesus saw that a crowd was running to the scene, he rebuked the evil spirit. You deaf and mute spirit, he said, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. The spirit shrieked, convulsed him violently and came out. The boy looked so much like a corpse that many said, he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him to his feet and he stood up. One commentator uh, writes this, he says, The father cries for help, honestly confessing the poverty of his faith. And Jesus answers, Not according to the poverty of the man's faith, but according to the riches of his grace. And, and that's the key, isn't it? Faith, belief, that is big or small, weak or strong. Belief in Jesus receives the riches of Jesus grace belief in Jesus re receives the riches of Jesus grace and that grace is very good do you see the specific words Mark uses here they're, they're not by accident Jesus casts this spirit out and what happens the boy falls down and he looks so lifeless so much like a corpse that actually the people there think ah, the boy's dead what does Jesus do Jesus takes him by the hand and he lifts him up. He literally, the word is, raises him. <laughs> it's no accident. It, dead and raised. Mark's not using those words just by coincidence. Especially in light of what we saw last week. You know, Jesus talking of his death and his resurrection. Mark is saying this is what Jesus does. This is what his grace does by faith. Jesus gives life from the dead. So it's really that simple and actually this story is more than far more than just an exorcism this is a picture of life this is a picture of jesus and what he has come to do for sinful and broken and spiritually bankrupt and tormented people like ourselves there is hope in jesus the hope of restoration of renewal of life even life beyond death itself and you and i we can receive it simply by believing simply by faith by faith in Jesus now uh, remember our two people who came in and, and believed in the church chairs well once they had found their seat tentatively or otherwise a bit later uh, a lot later in fact a third person came in uh, he was very late there's no one at the door uh, so he just had to let himself in and sanitize his hands and sign in and he came to the back doors and he looked around for a seat. Now, this Sunday was quite a day. Uh, he was running very late. Every single seat was taken. Not a single one left in the house. But that didn't phase this guy. It's like, that's all right. doesn't matter, you know. Uh, I'm just going to believe. I'm just going to believe that when I sit down, I will be held up. It's easy. I, I'm a pretty confident person. I, I, I can believe very, very hard. I'll just believe and I'll, I'll be held up. It's that easy. I don't need a chair at all. And so he did. He believed very, very hard. He summoned up all his faith and he, he believed as hard as he could and he lowered himself into the seat of his belief. And right now he's getting his coccyx put in a cast. Because that's not how it works, is it? That's not how it works at all. We don't just exhort ourselves, you know, I can believe more and then that will be good. I'll just, I'll just believe and I'll believe and I'll, I'll, I'll get what I want. Uh, s someone had written on the blackboard at our gym a while back, um, you can do anything if you just believe. It's, it's so motivational, isn't it? How, what a great thing to write at the gym. But I was so tempted. You know, you can do anything if you just believe. I was so tempted just to write beneath, I believe I can fly. <laughs> Look, because that's the problem, isn't it? It sounds great, but it doesn't work. I can believe anything I want, but I can't make it happen. It's not how we believe. It's not the strength of our belief. It's what we believe. It's who we believe even more that counts. We have that habit, don't we? That, that really awful habit of beating ourselves up. Oh, my belief is so weak. I doubt so much. I could never be saved. Well, here's the thing. If it rested on the strength of our faith, on the strength of our belief, 
we would all be stuffed. <laughs> if that's how we were saved, we would have no hope whatsoever. But that's not how we're saved. I believe. Help my unbelief. And Jesus does. Because that belief receives the riches of his grace. Simply believe, run to Jesus, trust him, and you receive life. You are saved by him. Not because your faith is so strong, but because his grace is so good. So run to Jesus. But don't run ahead of him. Now why do I say that? Well, remember the disciples. They've kind of faded to the back of this story, but they're going to come out again in just a moment. Things haven't gone so well for the disciples. Why is that? Well, what was going on for them? Well, look at verse 28 and 29. After Jesus had gone indoors, his disciples asked him privately, why couldn't we drive it out? He replied, this kind can come out only by prayer. Now, there's, there's a, a, a false track here that we get very excited about and we so often race off down. We think, oh, wow, this is really interesting, you know, stronger spirits and weaker spirits and different exorcism techniques. This is, this is really fascinating stuff. But actually, that's not the point at all. I mean, that, that might sound fascinating, but the point is far simpler and actually far better and more important. So remember the theme of this passage. The theme is belief. It's what belief looks like. It's, it's the strengths of belief or the lack of belief. So, so why does Jesus then come to them and start talking about prayer? I mean, it seems like a, a change of track, doesn't it? Well, actually, it's very simple. The simple fact is, belief and prayer are intrinsically linked. Um, I, I found this quote from one writer really, really helpful in, in bringing that to mind. Uh, this is what he said. Uh, he said, prayer is faith, or for belief. Prayer is faith turned to God. Prayer is faith turned to God. Both faith and prayer testify that spiritual power is not in oneself, but in God alone. And that's the key here. That's what Jesus is saying to his disciples. He's saying, you guys simply weren't trusting God. <laughs> you know, it's not that you'd met your match in this, this spirit or this situation. You just weren't trusting him. You know, if you were trusting God, you would have prayed to him and asked for his help and asked for his power. But you've just tried to do your thing, this thing in your own strength. You know, you've tried to do it in your own merit. And unsurprisingly, that's not gone well at all. Now, we've got to cut the disciples some, some slack here. From their point of view, it is kind of understandable. You know, in the past, they have been able to cut out, uh, cast out spirits. You know, and that was months ago. Look how far they've come since then. Look at all the things they've learned since then. Surely they'll be able to do it this time as well. But no, instead, they've gotten cocky. They've gotten overconfident. They've run ahead and they've tripped up. Uh, in my first year of uni, um, for some reason, I, I wound up enrolled in Chem 101. Uh, Chem 101, Veggie Chem, as I found out it was called, because you only need to be as smart as a lettuce to do Veggie Chem. I... I, I this is a digression, but I kid you not, the first lesson we learned how many centimetres there were in a metre. So, like, there's, there's an insight into uni for you. Now, look, as soon as I heard I was, I was enrolled in this, uh, I was pretty confident. Like, I'd done chem at college. We'd done as high a level chem as you could do there. I enjoyed it. I'd done well at it. So, so I was pretty cocky. I didn't take this unit very seriously. Um, you know, thinking, well, I've got this. I, I can just cruise. This would be a nice, relaxing semester. And that made one of our early labs in the class very embarrassing. Because we got in there, I completely ignored the instructions, because I don't know how to do this already. I've done it before. Rushed it, because you know, the earlier you finish, the sooner you can go home. And I completely stuffed it up. <laughs> I made a spectacular disaster of this experiment, and I got terrible marks. And that's the disciples here, isn't it? Yeah, we've got this. We can do this. We know how to do it. We'll be fine. Or not? Jesus says, don't run ahead or you'll trip up. Don't forget, believe. That's the key. Trust. 
Lean on him. Now, as so often in the Gospels, it's, it's so tempting to point the finger at the disciples and just have a bit of a chuckle at their expense. You know, how dumb are the disciples? And how dumb are we? Because we do exactly the same, don't we? We get so confident in our Christian life. We get so content with how things are tracking along. You know, I'm doing well. It's been great for me. I'm, I'm cruising along so nicely. And we forget that actually in all things, we utterly depend on God. I mean, let's, let's just use one example. Let's, let's use our prayer lives as a barometer of our trust in God. Now, let's say we were to put on a calendar, uh, chart you know, when, when times are going well, when times are going bad, and then tally up on every time, one of those days how often we're praying. You know, I can say for myself, and I can probably say with a fair deal of confidence for you two, that a trend will emerge. Times are good, we don't pray very much. Yeah, because times are good. Times are hard, we start praying a bit more. Times get really hard, we start praying a lot. Times get good, we slack back off. Why do I need it? How foolish we are. What does that tell us of ourselves it tells us we think we can go it alone, doesn't it? it? Tells us that we think we can we've got it. We can go without God. We get overconfident, we run ahead. And before we know it, we head for a fall. See, don't forget at any moment that you rely on God for everything for absolutely everything, in good and in bad. Spiritual power, your ability to live your Christian life well, your ability to grow in God and do what you do, that's, that's not in you. You don't possess that. That is 100% from God. You know how lazy we get when things are good. You know, we don't, we don't read our Bibles very much. We think, well, I've kind of read most of the stuff anyway. I know it. We don't pray very much because, you know, things are tracking well. God's got it. We don't participate in church. We don't know, Sunday or in weekly and connect because, you know, it's actually kind of a bit of hard work and we don't always feel the benefit of it very soon. And what happens? The pinch comes, the crisis hits, and we find out that our spiritual reserves are empty. We've got nothing. All those chances we had to fill ourselves up with God and now we strike out. Yes, when it comes to being saved, weak belief is enough. Because Jesus is enough. And yes, when it comes to living as a Christian, weak belief is enough. Because Jesus is enough. But even weak belief realizes, even weak belief knows that it needs Jesus. Because only Jesus is enough. See, we don't come to Jesus in his strength and in, you know, keep going in our own. It doesn't work like that. Instead, the Christian life is constant and humble and patient reliance on God in utterly everything. You know, it's not flashy. It's not spectacular or noteworthy. It's quiet and it's small and it's humble and yet powerful because God is powerful. You know, I think sometimes we, we, we have this tendency to look at, you know, the heroes of our faith, maybe people we've known or maybe famous people, you know, I don't know who your heroes are, but like the Luther and the Calvin and the, the Spurgeon and Lloyd-Jones and all, the, all these great Christians and we, we see all the amazing things that they've done. We see incredible deeds and inc incredible ministries and, and, and lives and we think, wow, what, what sort of people they were. Look at their faith, how strong and wonderful it was. It helped them achieve all this stuff. And yet, actually, they weren't special at all. Sorry to destroy your you know, hero worship, but they weren't special at all. If you read stories of their life, if you see how they lived, all that they actually did was trust God. <laughs> Nothing more than you're being asked to do right now. In their own time, in their own place, they relied on God. They simply believed him. And they lived in that belief. 
And so are you called to do. Believe and live in that belief. Just believe. It's not a ticket to getting whatever you wanted. It's not how God works. But it is how we live. And it is how we have life. Just believing. For him who believes, anything is possible in Jesus. Even, even life after death. Can you believe that? Even life after death. Even a path through crisis. Even hope in hard times. Anything is possible. Not because your belief is so good. But because he is. Believe. And help us in our unbelief. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we... We thank you for your sheer goodness to us. That even in the poverty and weakness of our belief, you show the immeasurable riches of your grace in Jesus. For you take pity on us. You lift us out of our despair and death. You forgive us and you give us life. Father, our belief so often is so weak. So help us, we pray. Forgive us when we run ahead of you, when we're tempted to go in our own strength. Help us to trust in you every day, every moment. Father, grow our belief, we pray. Make us humble and dependent, going to you and leaning on you always and in everything. Father, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.